thank you for tuning in to our next video of Meet Your Majors here at the College of Mount St. Vincent. My name is Andrew Creel, and I am an Associate Director for Admission here at CMSV, and I'm honored and privileged to welcome Dr. Peter Luthi. Dr. Peter Luthi, how are you today? Doing pretty good, doing pretty good. I'm an Associate Professor of, uh, of Mathematics here at the, at the college. I'm also the Chair of the Math Department. Uh, this is my sixth year, I guess, <laughs> sixth year here before you know, I, I did my PhD at Cornell in 2013, and then I did a postdoc at WashU in St. Louis for a few years before coming here. So it's been a, a short, short six years, but also feels like a long time. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Luthi. And if you're continuing to watching all of our major, major videos, they're available on YouTube and Instagram. And if you have any questions for Dr. Luthi, you could drop them down in the comment section below. You can email us at admissions.office at mountstvinson.edu, and we'll be sure to pass on that question to Dr. Luthi. And without further ado, I'll now welcome Dr. Luthi to present on math and data analytics here at the College of Mount St. Vincent. All right, thanks very much. I'll talk about the math major a little bit first, and then the data analytics major as well. There's, there is uh, quite a bit of overlap between the two. Before I sort of get into the details of the, of the major, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some relatively simple ideas, how powerful those ideas can be, and sort of understanding uh, a lot of the world around us. I'm just, this is a, a paper by um, Carlos Bustamante and some uh, quite a few co-authors. The study that they did, they basically asked uh, something like, a thousand uh, European uh, citizens. They collected a genetic sample from each of them. They, they sequenced their genome and asked them where their grandmother was from in Europe. So what country was their grandmother from? And so you sort of get this, uh, uh, they looked at something like 100,000 different genetic markers. So like different genes that, that people have. Um, and they, they basically created this big array of numbers where there's sort of one row for each person and in each column in the array is a, you know, a basically a zero or a one, a one saying that they have that genetic mark or a zero saying they didn't. Um, so, you know, so it would be like, I, you know, I, not that I'm a European resident, but it, you know, I'd have one row would be me. And then, you know, it would be like the first column, you know, would be some particular gene you know, related to hair color or whatever, whatever it is, right? So they, and they looked at a hundred thousand of those uh, for each person. And so there's a, a relatively simple technique called principal component analysis that they did. And really they're like, you know, linear algebra is sort of an inter, is a second year type course. So an intermediate type course. And kind of by the end of that, of, of linear algebra one, after one semester, you sort of understand enough that you could understand what they did here. And so what they did with these principal component uh, analysis, basically every um, sort of dot here, <laughs> or every little uh, data value, maybe I'll zoom in. So you can sort of see there's all these kind of little data points on this plane. So principal component analysis out of this gigantic array that they have, somehow there's like two key components, two principal components that come out of that. And each data point becomes sort of a point on a two-dimensional plane, right? So a point on the plane. And they've colored, each, so each each little kind of dot looking thing here is a person. And they've colored each of the dots by where they said their maternal grandmother was from, so where their mother's mother is from. And so you can see like uh, in this bottom left corner here, there's this sort of purple and blue. Uh, that sort of, you know, ES for Spain, or, you know, España, and then PT for Portugal, right? The sort of uh, yellow color next to that is France, and then the pink is, uh, I believe, Switzerland. Italy is below that. You can see Great Britain and Ireland are sort of above those. They've, you know, the map of Europe, you can sort of see in the top right corner, they've recreated a map of Europe purely from genes. There's no, they, they didn't, they didn't take, they did nothing except put each of these points on a plane these two principal components and hidden it hidden among a, a group of people, a group of Europeans as a map of Europe hidden in their genes, not, a, not within any individual person's genes, but somehow how they are in aggregate, a large group of people, you can sort of yeah, recreate a map of Europe just from information about their genetic, uh, the, the genetic code of those people. And it, it, it's like the mathematics behind this, it, like the, you know, the theory behind it is actually not that complicated. It maybe seems complicated now, but it, it really is not that complicated. But there's, uh, you know, the hard part is like 
you know, implementing this in a computer and the database that you have is really big. So how do you make it so that the computer can actually handle it? Those types of things. Those are more challenging problems, but really at the core, a lot of really interesting things are sort of understandable with relatively simple uh, mathematical concepts. So a lot, I mean, with a, an undergraduate degree in mathematics, you sort of for sure would be prepared just to, to uh, understand everything that the, the authors did in this in this article. So maybe just talk a little bit about uh, about the major. So there's, uh, in terms of tenured uh, professors, there's, there's three of us here, including myself. My area of, of uh, specialty is in harmonic analysis. My colleague, Amir Niknijad, is also a professor here. He sort of works in like computational biology or computational chemistry. Chemistry works in, with a group in Germany that does uh, pharmaceutical design, so designing drugs with a specific uh, with a specific purpose. And then the third professor is uh, is uh, Dr. Viktor Moroshnikov, um, and his a his area of interest is sort of in, in geophysics. Pre previous life, he worked in sort of helping people construct dams in uh, in Eastern Europe, and that's sort of the makeup the makeup of us. So. We sort of all, I, I was also a physics major when I was in college in addition to, to being a math major. So I, I have a lot of interest in applied uh, problems and practical ap applications for things. And I know all of my colleagues sort of share that, share that interest as, as well. So, you know, have interest in, in not just in mathematics as an interesting subject to study, but mathematics as sort of a, a useful thing to study as well. So in terms of the, the major, we've sort of, I've, you know, have the list of all the required courses here, but really, you know, from the perspective of uh, your first couple of years, uh, you'll take the calculus sequence, so Calc 1, 2, and 3. A, lo a lot of the students that enter into the, the, the mount, um, they will take pre-calculus as well. So usually by the end of your second year, you've taken pre-calculus, three semesters of calculus. So you'll be through the calc sequence. Um, frequently, you'll take biomedical statistics. We offer that every semester. Uh, so some statistics under your belt and then sort of discrete math, linear algebra and computing one, we sort of computing uh, one here. Uh, we sort of offer those courses probably like every three semesters or, you know, every three semesters, each of them. So you'll probably take one of them in your sophomore year. And then, yeah, sort of the remaining courses, you'll ba basically take two a, two a semester, roughly speaking, for your junior and senior year. Um, you'll take this capstone sequence at the end, capstone one and two. Um, and then one more open elective. I usually, you know, we have a course in computer programming and a course in sort of introduction to data science. I encourage students to, to take that as well. And, you know, one of those courses counts as the as an elective. So that's sort of the, the major um, for math. You know, the probably the vast majority of the students that complete the major in mathematics with us uh, go on to become teachers. A lot of them have got, I mean, they, we have not had a student who was interested in, in doing a master's program in education who has not been accepted into a master's program in education. Um, we've had some that have done New York Teaching Fellows. We had a student that went to the, I think it's the Steinhardt School at NYU. Um, the education program was accepted there. We've had students that have been accepted at Columbia uh, Teachers College, things like that. Although I was sort of shocked at how exp expensive Teachers College, one, one year at Teachers College is $90,000. <laughs> A master's degree which sort of shocked me so the vast majority of of, uh, of our students sort of go into teaching and in general are very successful we've had a couple that have done mbas in years past we've had students that have gone on to uh you know sort of more engineering type things we've had a couple of students that are more interested in data science so there, there's uh there are a lot of a lot a tremendous number of careers if you're interested in mathematics i think one of the things that students find confusing or that the reason, you know, a lot of our students are very practical minded. They, they want a job, they, what they want to major in something that's going to get them a job, which, you know, I, I, that makes sense. <laughs> so, you know, if you go into a nursing degree program, you become a nurse, you go into a teaching teacher ed program, you become a teacher. But like, has any, no one's ever met somebody whose job is mathematician, <laughs> even though that's theoretically what the major would go into. But mathematicians are employed in, in a tremendous number of different jobs. And that was sort of how our, our major in data analytics sort of grew out of that huge area of the economy that is that is growing, where it's sort of a mixture of some statistics, some computer science, uh, some mathematics, and some sort of domain specific uh, um, knowledge. So there's people that are you know working in sports analytics. There's people in digital marketing. There's uh, um, sort of a tre tremendous amount of stuff in uh, sort of operations research, sort of, uh, you know, like how how businesses run, so, uh, sort of things like that. Um, and there's just this huge growing 
demand for jobs for people that are not necessarily that they know computer science at the level of a software developer, but they have some understanding of computer programming. They don't necessarily need to be know enough as much statistics as a professional statistician. They don't need to know as much mathematics as sort of a professional mathematician, but they're relatively fluent in discussing those topics and they're able to communicate effectively with business people, you know, either sort of more business minded uh, people in a company or, you know, the super nerds that work for a company, they're able to sort of translate between those two groups. Um, there's a, there's a, just a huge area of growth in, in terms of number of jobs. And the U.S. just doesn't produce enough people in those jobs. So, you know, a lot of the people that were that are being employed now are their you know, H-1B visa candidates, basically. So they're highly educated people from overseas. But most companies, I mean, it costs a lot of money for a company to, to maintain visa status for people. Um, and, you know, depending on, on the political climate of the two countries, I mean, you could suddenly have H-1B visa uh, the numbers of H-1B visas you can get can go down. So companies are interested in hiring Americans to do these jobs. <laughs> That's the reality. I think it's a really great career path for students to sort of go down. And maybe just as, as an example, last spring I taught this course in course sequence. We teach it every year. So there's a two semester sequence in Foundations of Python Programming and then a follow up course, How to Think Like a Data Scientist. Um, sort of intro to, intro, introduction to data science. Uh, we sort of developed these courses with uh, Google and a bunch of other professors from all over the all over the country. Yeah, in, in these sort of course sequence, you learn sort of the basics of Python, which is the most popular programming language today. Relatively easy to learn, really powerful. And in the follow-up course, we learn Pandas, which is the acronym is like Python Analysis and Data Science, <laughs> basically. Um, and sort of using the, learning how to use those tools. Um, to pull data sets out off the web, all sorts of different things like that. And so I'm just, uh, you know, especially last semester, I mean, the whole world got shut down by COVID basically. You know, I mean, of course it was, you know, our college went virtual, all that, all that kind of thing. But one sort of, you know, quote unquote positive, if you can think of it that way, is it was just this massive source of data and information. And so one of the projects that we worked on at the end of the last semester was, can we sort of map create a map of COVID-19 across the United States over time. So every day, basically in every state, we could look at the number, total number of cases that have occurred in that state and then divide by the population. So you're, you're uh, right, obviously, like if you're comparing New York to Iowa, like New York has 10 times, you know, 20 times more people than Iowa has, 10 times more people, whatever it is. So obviously there's gonna be more cases there, but so if you sort of divide by population, you're kind of comparing every state in a fair way. Basically built is a data set that's curated by the New York Times that they made available to everybody. And so here's, this is just a blank map of every county in the US. And this database that uh, the New York Times generated is every county, the number of cases in every county in the United States every day. <laughs> Uh, and sort of generating generating a map. So here's the map on April 9th, 2020. So the darker colors here, so if it's totally blank, it means that the county hasn't yet reported any COVID-19 cases. So this is per relatively early in COVID. Dark blue means it's there's some number, but it's very, very low. And you can sort of see if, if the um, number is high, so the per capita number of cases is high, you get colored sort of yellow. And so obviously at the beginning of April, New York City was being totally decimated by, by COVID. So, but you can sort of see, you sort of get a snapshot of what it looks like. There's sort of a county over here where there's a, there was an outbreak. Then you sort of see that over time where, where at some point in May, I think last year or June, there was like a meatpacking plant in Minnesota or something where there was an outbreak. And of course, like, you know, if you're in a small county, one large employer has an outbreak. I mean, that, that could that could be really high. Other places, uh, so Atlanta over here and New Orleans, New Orleans down in the, in the bottom. But so what we were able to do is sort of pull all this data, generate one of these for every single day and create a map. So here's the a map over time, so this is at the top, but at the top, so this is per capita totals. So all, not not daily cases, but this is a total number of cases in every county per capita. And this this is from January 21st up through 2020, up through April 4th, 2020. So you can sort of see at this point, right, those same counties that I mentioned, filled in all the ones that haven't reported any data, I set them to zero, so I filled in, filled in the map here. But you can sort of watch over time. So this is days going by. So each, each uh, there's a few frames per day. So you can sort of see, okay, in, in May, June, sort of July is when there's this big uh, explosion all through the Southeast. 
So you can sort of see these, these counties are kind of heating up over time, right? There's more increased amount of COVID in those areas. And you're starting to see some counties have sort of big outbreaks. Now we're into September, October, there's a, a large number of cases in, in uh, North and South Dakota. So sort of the Midwest starts to heat up. So you're sort of able to see over time kind of how COVID has you know, evolved through the country. What started out as sort of a, a problem in New York, really, I mean, New York and so in uh, New Orleans in April by, so now we're in July, this is, or January, this is February of this year, March 17th, so uh, yesterday or a couple days ago. Or you can sort of see that it's it's spread all the way through the country. The only areas that uh, that aren't really affected are kind of Maine. Uh, part, that's where I'm from originally, the Northeast. So partially because there are no people there. <laughs> that's very very low population density. But even even in this even in southern Maine, where there, where there is more population, um, I don't know people. Uh, they're better about sort of avoiding each other, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, but this is the, the kind of thing that, you know, after just one year in this course, you're sort of at the level where you could generate animations like this. You're able to pull, pull data down from the web, do sort of different data analyses, create maps like this on, at the level of counties. I mean, you can create, you know, more traditional charts. This te te technically this is called a core plus, but you can create a whole bunch of different, uh, different things using this it's, and uh, really doesn't take that. I mean, a year maybe feels a long time when you're young, but a year of effort to put into something to learn, to be able to do something like this is, it's a big payoff uh, for a relatively short amount of time. Here's sort of the, the major data analytics. So yeah, these two courses that I mentioned, the fundamentals of Python and how to think like a data scientist, those are sort of the core classes you'll take as a, as a sophomore. For us listed here, this data 300 in the intermediate level, this is actually biomedical statistics. Linear Algebra 1, which I mentioned in the math major, and then this uh, philosophy course, the data of ethics of data and artificial intelligence. We have a professor uh, in the philosophy department who this is his area of research, is what, what does it mean to live in a world where decisions are made by computers and they, the computers can't explain the decision to us. It just it's, it's like praying to the Oracle, <laughs> right? You know, that you ask the Oracle to tell you what to do. Or they tell you, the Oracle tells you what to do, but you don't know why. We're teaching it for the first time actually this semester. The students seem to really enjoy it. I kind of wish I could sit on, sit on the class too, but. And then there's a lot of flexibility after that. So, so the sort of first five or six classes um, that you, you should try to take are kind of fixed, but then there's a whole bunch of freedom in the, uh, in what you could could take. So there are quite a few business courses um, that we just recommend students students uh, try to take. So quantitative methods, fundamentals of information science, operations methods and systems. So that, that sort of gets into quantitative aspects of the business world. There's also some more advanced uh, linear algebra class, some discrete mathematics, all that sort of good stuff like that. But really the, the my focus over time is to sort of add more interdisciplinary type data courses. So uh, one that I taught last semester was on sports analytics. So trying to you know understand Kevin Durant got picked up by the Nets slightly more than a year ago, but he had just blown out his Achilles tendon. So he's like one of the best players ever to play the game, but he just had this huge injury. So is he worth a max contract? I mean, should you pay should you pay him the absolute max? You know, it could be that he comes back, he's 85%, he's, I mean, 85% of Kevin Durant's still really good, but is he still, is 85% of Kevin Durant still worth a max contract? What are the odds that that happens? So uh, those are the kinds of questions that it would be nice to try to answer. Another thing we, we tackled was uh, the 2017 Astros sign stealing scandal. Did the Astros actually cheat? Can you tell just from their at-bats? Can you tell if they cheated or not? And then what advantage did they get out of it? because the 2017 Astros are also a really good road team. So it wasn't just uh, that they were cheating at home. They were really good, good they're actually better away than they were at home. But yeah, sort of tackling those types of things. I, I'm hoping to teach a course on quantitative gerrymandering, which is about every 10 years, every state creates new voting districts and the party in power can sort of cook the books to, to advantage themselves <laughs> um, and trying to understand sort of quantitatively, how can you prove that that has happened or demonstrate that it's almost certain that's, that that has happened. So there's just a lot of sort of applications of this stuff. Uh, you know, if a student came in and said they were really interested in some other topic, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to sort of really you know develop a course in kind of any area that uh, a student is interested in but that's that's the the sort of power of, of this sort of data science or data analytics in general is just that it's very cross-disciplinary it's it's 
you know, skill set that translates very easily into a lot of different fields, but you're much better at data science if you have some sort of domain understanding. So you're going to be a better, you're going to be, you know, if you're really interested in basketball, you're going to be better at understanding the sports analytics of the basketball world than you are baseball. And the, that the skill, the sort of domain specific knowledge that you have helps you ask good questions and understand sort of nuances of certain things. And so that's, yeah, that's the, you know, the benefit, I guess, of uh, understanding something's about the area that you're that you're going to apply data science in. Uh, that's the, those are sort of the two majors. I guess that's kind of what I had to say about the about the two majors. Hopefully, if you're excited about math and data science. You'll you'll come and join us. Perfect. Thank you for that, Dr. Luthien. Such an in-depth um, analysis of both the majors that we offer here at CMSV. Uh, for you, we we do get a lot of frequently asked questions in the admissions office about each of the majors offered here at CMSV. And just to get you started right here, and you mentioned a few of the classes. What is one of your favorite classes to teach here at CMSV? I still love teaching linear algebra. That's probably my favorite, just because there's a lot of really interesting mathematics and it's really useful in all sorts of different areas. But I think actually now it is the these two, intro, intro to Python and how to think like a data scientist, those two classes probably are now my favorite to teach, just because it's like such an empowering tool to have. I'm sure everybody is like, use a computer, use your smartphone, but like once you start to actually kind of understand how they work, <laughs> you're interested in video games. Like you can go and uh, you can go and find a database of every video game that's ever been sold, how many units it sold, what genre it was in, who the developer was. I mean, you can sort of go and look at those that data set and figure out like what was the best year for platformers or you know any sort of topic like that that so i mean it just yeah it really is it is just a really empowering tool uh, and students really uh, you know not that linear algebra isn't an empowering tool but it's like you don't have something in your hands that you can do things with <laughs> whereas the yeah the sort of computer computer programming this data science stuff you really get something that you can use regrettably yeah absolutely respect the hustle there you know, yeah. using, using the education to get ahead for sure that's and right you earlier dr luthi there's only about three faculty in your within your department correct what do one-on-one -on -one office hours look like for each each one of you and also what type of issues do students typically bring up in those office hours pretty much all of us are available a lot i mean i'm you know i have my normal office hours but if it's you know if, I don't know that I would be necessarily would meet super regularly outside of them, but definitely if a student needs, you know, needs to meet about something outside of my regular office hours, I'm, you know, I've definitely, I've met with students at five, you know, certainly, especially now with Zoom, like I have Zoom meetings sometimes at eight o'clock, you know, <laughs> it's not that I super love doing, doing late night meetings or anything, but sometimes it's just what it, that's just what it takes. So I, you know, overall, I think in, in every department, but certainly in this department, we're really focused on ensuring students are at, you know as prepared for things as they can so you, at least usually for me some students they come in we talk about the problem sets that they're working on or a project that they're working on sort of work through those things sometimes they come by asking about you know are, are there sort of projects that they can work on outside of class especially you know with COVID happening there's people have a lot more free time so it's like what can i do is so, you know i've, I've only I've, i can only watch so much netflix so what else uh, what else can i do the reality of most students at the mount i mean i i did my phd at cornell you know most of the students at cornell didn't have to work at all they weren't working. They were able to just do school all day, all all, t all, all the time. And uh, you know, a lot of our students just aren't in that boat. They're you know coming from middle you know middle class backgrounds, humble humble backgrounds. And so, like I try as much as much as possible to be flexible about due dates. If a student has you know not even just work work obligations. I mean, like I had one student uh, in real analysis last semester, which real analysis is a pretty challenging class. And she never mentioned it at all, but like she was having to you know be the primary educator for her sister's kid while her sister was going to work like when the schools were all closed she ne just never said it like it wasn't or it was like not until the end of the semester she mentioned it she was talking we gave students the option to take classes pass fail and she was she came by and asked about like well should i i was thinking about taking a pass fail i was you know she's like one of the best students we've had at the college and I was like, don't do not do not take it. But I just had she just never, you know, this was just like her regular reality was, you know, that this uh, complicated thing. So um, so some of that, that stuff comes up from time to time, having good communication about what's going on. If there if there are things sort of limiting somebody's ability to to uh, be in class at some some point in time, um, that stuff comes up, too. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that we pride ourselves on here at CMSB is meeting the students where they are. If yeah. you do need additional help or you need some more time speaking with a professor after hours in some type of capacity, whether it's on Zoom or in person, it could definitely be made for, for those students. And for our first year students, you know, wrapping up senior year of high school, coming in as the class of 2025 in the fall, what is the average class size of the introductory courses that are, that are taught within the math and data analytics major here at CMSB? Our calculus class, or calculus and pre-calculus, it depends, actually varies quite a bit from year to year, probably like 10 to 15 students in Calc 1 every semester. So, I mean, sometimes it can be, I've had, I've taught it before where it's closer to 20, but I've also taught it before, this semester, uh, it's closer to 10. So yeah, it sort of varies, varies quite a bit in Calc 1 in the, in the, Introduction to Python class, it's right, right around 10, 10, 10 to 12 is, uh, is kind of a good, a good spot. Yeah, hopefully, I mean, I am sort of uh, looking forward to, to when, you know, the COVID restrictions are sort of lifted and students can kind of, you know, interact in, in class a little more safely. That's, that's really a, a key component in the data science class, the pr programming classes, is that students sort of interact with each other, work on, work on programs together, sort of learn from each other. You mentioned those introductory courses and then eventually students do graduate with those degrees. Are there any research opportunities or like internships for undergraduates throughout this department? Uh, definitely. So so we actually have a social research center at the college, the Fischlinger Center. A professor who is like the director of that, Matt Archibald. Um, so he's in the, he's part time. He's the director of the center and he's part time. He's also a prof professor in sociology. Um, and so that's like one thing that we're working on now is sort of getting students involved in a um, sort of project related, directly related to his research interests. So, um, you know, so once you've once you've collected the data, uh, how do you, you know, basically he has an old an old project that he'd worked on. He wants to update it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, kind of has an idea of how things should go, but, you know, is interested in getting a student involved and, and sort of working through uh, the next kind of, uh, you know, decade worth of data, um, sort of working through that and doing it in a different, you know, doing it in a different um, um, environment. So we, yeah, we have sort of students working directly on that. I know with uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Nickenjad, he's taken, he, so he has, he collaborates with a group in Germany, uh, in Berlin, at the SUSE Institute there, doing pharmaceutical design. He's taken a few students uh, with him over there, actually, yeah, doing directly doing research on uh, with him and a pretty big group, interdisciplinary group of people, you know, mathematicians, you know, computer scientists, statisticians, kind of all working together on the same uh, same projects. So yeah, there's definitely re research opportunities. Um, certainly yeah, right now I actually have an honor student that I'm working with that uh, we're studying college assessment. <laughs> uh, so we're the college every three years. So actually this year they're doing the National Survey of Student Engagement. Um, but in sort of last year, every three years, last year, three years before that, three years before that, they do sort of an internal survey of students, sort of seeing asking them about different, you know, how do they feel about the dining halls? How do they feel about academic advising? How do they feel about the gym? Sort of all just getting a sense of what are we doing well? What do we do? What could we be doing better? Yeah, so I'm working with the students sort of going through that, that database. There's very few things that we sort of rate poorly on, but there's some things where, okay, even if, you know, one thing that, that popped up to us in the survey, so we have sort of uh, interview prep materials. Our Oxley Advising Center has interview prep uh, materials, seminars, and things like that. Uh, and we've we saw not that we were rated poorly in that category, but there was like half of the students that responded said they had no experience, like they just hadn't taken advantage of it. And that's going to be like a huge difference. Like if you go to a job interview, to having no idea what to expect, like you're just going to interview poorly. It doesn't matter like how charismatic you are, and like you you need to prep a little bit to, to to be successful. And so that was sort of one of the one of the things that we. I'm interested in is also just involving students in the process of like what can we you know what could could the student body as a whole do to also help improve some of these things but yeah there's definitely you know lots of data gets generated and there's not enough people to, to analyze it so there are definitely lots of uh, yeah lots of research opportunities for sure absolutely and i'm sure that that helps the students just gain another light into into their study 
Uh, for you, Dr. Luthi, I'm sure you've taught plenty of plenty of students that have succeeded in this program in math and data analytics specifically. For you, what are a couple of the characteristics of those students that stick out to you, of students that succeeded within this program? I'm sure that it's the same in every program. It's definitely people that put in consistent work, <laughs> not just uh, like homework. If homework's due on Thursdays, they're not that Wednesday night is not the only time that they're thinking about the material. They're sort of doing a little bit all the time. They're thinking about it. They like it. I mean, that's another key, key, key aspect uh, is they enjoy, do, they enjoy it. I mean, I remember, you know, like I had a student three or four years ago, I guess now, who, you know, she was a good student. I mean, she wasn't like the best student in my in the class at the time, but she just liked it. I remember we were, we were talking about in a logic and proof class, and then we were talking about how logic and a certain kind of polynomial, they're sort of the same thing. If you want to check if like two logical statements are the same, you can convert it into checking if like two polynomials are equal. Yeah, I mean, I just remember her saying like unprompted. It wasn't like I asked people if they liked it. She was just like, that's so cool, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's really, I, I mean, that's the kind of thing that, you know, when you're going in to talk to an employer or something like that, it, they're gonna notice that you like it, right? Or it, when you're at work, they're gonna notice you enjoy doing it you, and you're gonna be more willing to do it, <laughs> to work hard if you enjoy doing it. So I, I would say the, the biggest characteristics are they just, they enjoy math, they enjoy sort of working on problems. Yeah, and then they're just also sort of, uh, they're able to put in cons just consistent effort. You know, it doesn't have to be like every day necessarily, but they're sort of organized and, you know, kind of a grind, I guess, they're a grinder. <laughs> hey, continue to put in that work and continue to stay passionate about what they're doing is something that we see a lot of Mount St. Vincent students have. Wrapping up this, this video now of Nutra Majors, there is another question. We do have the Academic Resource Center available on campus and it's free tutoring available to all students. From your perspective, what kind of tutoring and assistance is available within your department for the students? There's a lot. So, I mean, math, uh, even if you're a like, really strong student, I know at least from my own experience, when I was in college, I was a math tutor. It really helps you master the material. You stay up on it. I mean, math is also this area, this sort of discipline that's very vertical. Like if you want to learn the next stuff, you really have to have mastered the earlier stuff. Not that, you know, English isn't like that, but let's say you don't really like Shakespeare, like you can still be an English major and like kind of avoid that. Whereas like, if you haven't really mastered calculus, like some of the upper level courses are going to be a struggle. So a lot of our students, are, I mean, I always encourage our students to be tutors, but we have tutor tutoring in Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, Linear Algebra. I mean, it's sort of all the basic courses, the data analytics, the, that sort of programming and data science sequence is really new. We, this is the second year that we've taught it. So it's, it's a brand new program, but I think now we have enough students that like we'll have tutoring available in that as well. Yeah, I just, I always encourage students, it, it just forces you to keep up on your skills too. It's, uh, and you're getting paid, so you get to meet students and people from different ba different backgrounds uh, as well. So I think probably we're among the, the better staffed areas of the arc that we just have. Yeah, all, all, the whole calculus sequence, most of the 200 level biomedics for sure, most of the 200 level classes as well. So t tons of tutoring options. Yeah, definitely just tons of tutoring options as a job. Um, yep. getting that peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, and it's also free and available to students both in person and online, which helps them so much. Dr. Luther, this has been a pleasure so far, but before we wrap up, we do have our last question. From your perspective, being a professor here at the College of Mount St. Vincent and having our students finish high school by in May and June and enrolling at the college this early, early fall, what would be one tip or advice you would want to give them at this stage uh, in their process in getting selected mm -hmm. and enrolling at the College of Mount St. Vincent? It's a good question. When I was applying for college, sort of the big decision that I had was I could go to like, you know, essentially back home, the University of Maine was like the big the big school around. I ended up going to a small liberal arts college, Connecticut College in uh, Southeast Connecticut, very similar to the Mount. <laughs> I mean, you know, was an all women's college until night, right around 1970, just like the Mount, the Mount was. So at a place like the Mount, you are going to get to know your professors <laughs> really well. Like you're, you know, the math department, there's only three of us. In the psychology department, I think there's six or seven. In uh, business, I think it's around the same. So you're really like, you're gonna get to know the, know your professors really well. They're gonna get to know you really well. You're gonna be able to, you know, hopefully find your tribe, you know, your people that are gonna make you feel comfortable, find a professor that you can do some research with. Whereas I it is, it's just, 
at a big a big school. You know, I have colleagues at, at you know John Jay and uh, different CUNY campuses. I think it could be really great for students, but the small environment is also really attractive. And so that would be sort of my suggestion is just to kind of figure out which of those two environments is most. You know, do you prefer kind of a having access to a lot of different things or you're sort of looking more for like a more family kind of vibe. You know, you're gonna you're gonna have a really tight cohort that you're gonna enter and you're you know finish finish college with. That's kind of the my kind of recommendation is sort of think between those two out outcomes, which one is most attractive to you as a student. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Luthi. And thank you for your time learning more about the math and data analytics majors offered here at CMSB. And thank you for everyone who is watching. If you want to watch more videos of Meet Your Major, you can click the videos on the screen that we have available now. And if you have any questions for Dr. Luthi or the admissions office, you can email us at admissions.office at mountsinvinson.edu. And be on the lookout for Accepting Students Month this April all the way from April 1st to the end of April. We're also looking at hosting in-person Accepting Students Days, Future Fin Meetups, and even a First Generation Day to celebrate all of our First Generation Accepting Students. Thank you so much again, Dr. Luthi, and thank you everyone for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye, everyone. Take care. Hope to see you guys next year. When I was in high school, I was just like, super shy like i was just really quiet i just kind of wanted to like get through the day not really talk to anybody you know i had my group of friends that, that i you know after school we would go and hang out but like in my classes i was just kind of really quiet i didn't i honestly didn't really like school that much until the end of high school but like when i went to college i, I really made a concerted effort to not i didn't like being that person <laughs> i didn't like being the shy kid that you know had low self-esteem and i was like I, I just didn't i so i made a concerted effort to not do that and not be that way anymore, <laughs> to go out, force myself into different different situations, really dedicated myself to, to education. I had, a, I had a lot of fun in college too, but I, I was working like 20, 25 hours a week while I was in college also. But I really just, you know, I spent a lot of time studying, <laughs> just really focused on that. There's no secret to success is just, is practice. <laughs> That's really what it is. doesn't matter what, it, if you're shooting free throws or you're le learning to diagonalize a matrix, it's just, you gotta, it's, uh, you know, not just any amount of time is gonna help you. It's gotta be sort of, you gotta practice smart, I guess. <laughs> effect, there's effective ways to do, the, do that kind of practice, but it really is, there's a, you gotta put the time in, there's no shortcuts. That would be sort of, yeah, in terms of kind of, uh, for first year students kind of entering college, what are the aspects of your personality that you like? What are some aspects of your personality or sort of intellectual capacity that you like and dislike? And then, you know, make, focus on the things that you like Try to improve on the things that you don't like it but ultimately you have to do it one difference in, in, in between college and high school is in, in college you sort of have a lot more freedom but that puts a lot more responsibility on you to to take advantage of of the resources that are available so you know go to your professor's office hours you should uh, you know talk to them about different time you want career advice ask them about it you know um there most of us are happy to talk about you know sort of anything basically <laughs>